Rhapsody, I want to thank you for visiting with me today in your home state, in your hometown, or kind of hometown, right? Right, kind of hometown. Um, uh, as I told you, when we've been hanging out for a couple hours, mm -hmm. uh, this is self-made. This is about me uh, talking to people that I admire, that I think have done something truly special and in a unique way. And for that, first I want to cheers to you. Oh, we got to cheers that up. Cheers to you and being self-made. Thank you. Oh, that's so good. Oh. <laughs> for you, music, when did that click for you? Early. Uh, I was probably about five or six years old. Um, I grew up in a house where music was always played, whether my mom was up on Saturday mornings cleaning, listening to Tina Turner, Patti LaBelle, she has a radio in the kitchen. She listens to music when she cooks. My dad and me would watch Video Soul together and record it on VHS, and we'd go back on Sunday and watch it again. They nailed a speaker out to a tree, so when he's cutting grass and we're playing basketball, music is always on. So I fell in love with music at a very early age, but I was like five or six when I knew I wanted to do it, and it was uh, MC Light's Poor George video. Wow. You know, that's what's like. Yo, that's a woman rapping. For me, that was the first time I saw a female doing this. I was like, yo, this is you? ill. I want to say I was like five, maybe. And you remember that. I, so remember, like... I remember vividly. I remember like every time my dad had like an old two-door Mazda. And I remember like just always going with him to work or just going down the road. And that song would come on and I would rhyme it word for word. And it's just like, yo, this is my jam. Like. I vividly remember that. Anything before that was probably Michael Jackson. Yeah. And it's but Michael Jackson that made me think I could do it because I can't sing. Yeah. <laughs> and I couldn't do the moonwalk. Yeah. You, you uh, couldn't relate to I that. I couldn't. I couldn't relate, but I loved it. And it's just like ah, but MC Light made me believe that it was something I could do. Here, the idea is to go to school. Yeah. Get a job. Get married. Have yeah. kids. And so it's just like you're doing music, but you're not making no money. Yeah. And where's your boyfriend? You know, it was it was that. Um, and one thing I learned about parents, they don't want to see you struggle yeah. at the end of the day. So they were supportive where, you know, whatever you need, we're going to make sure you got somewhere to stay, like you can eat. But at the same time, we're going to be on you. Like, did you go look for a job today? Like, you can't do music on the side. So there was like this balance I had to find where it was just like, I hear you, but I gotta go do my own. So, so take me through it. Let's take grade school, high school. Right. Music. Did it, were you, how involved, how, what were you doing at the time to be involved in it? Nothing other than just listening. Listening, listening to it. That was it. I was playing sports. Yeah. Um, I, I wanted to get into it in middle school. I wanted to take band and learn how to read music and read notes and how to play. And I wanted to play the drums originally, but that's always the first thing to go. Yeah. You know? So um, I picked up the clarinet <laughs> and I ended up dropping out of band in two days because my music teacher put his mouth on my clarinet. You didn't like it. I didn't like that. <laughs> Why the I drums? Could... What was the interest in the drums first? Um, I think it just growing up listening to hip hop, it was that boom, yeah. clap. Boom, boom, yeah. boom, clap. And I wanted to learn how to play that. And drummers look cool. It was just a cool thing. Yeah. Like, there's nothing really cool about the clarinet. I had an older sister that had the flute. Like, <laughs> so was clarinet decided for you or someone, or you decided? It was that? like one of the last things. So yeah. I was like, I'll, I'll play the clarinet. So, yeah. Um, and so high school, same thing. When did it click in for music for you after then, for college? For college? Um, the passion of it never left. Yeah. Like, when I left high school and got to college, I started writing. And I started writing poetry first, and then that turned into lyrics. But it was only for me. Like, nobody really knew I did it except I had a best friend. And um, my best friend was actively pursuing music. Like, you know, he was doing it as a solo artist, but he was also in a group by the name of Influential. And his friend's name was Charlie Smarts. So we all went to NC State together. Yeah. It was myself, Charlie, but Charlie knew all these other people that did music, whether they were DJ producers. And he came to me one day, he was like, what you think about helping me start a hip hop organization? Like hip hop doesn't exist at NC State for the most part. Let's fill the voice. I'm like, let's do it. What year was this? This was uh, 2005, okay. 2005. So we have a meeting, you know, we get in the dorm conference room. It's five of us and we talk about it. we're going to create this organization we're going to go file it with the campus so we can have events and 
rent equipment for free and we're gonna you know have shows in the middle of the brickyard which is the common area where all the students you know pass through for campus or go have lunch and we're just gonna have rap battles and everything so one summer they decided to make a mixtape and by this time they we, being the organization yeah. that we created which at this time we had about 30 members okay. and everybody did something musical except me <laughs> you know um so I went to the studio where they're recording this mixtape one day and my, my homie, he looks at me, he goes, I know you write, so won't you just get in the booth and just have fun with it? Like this is the talk that he sits and has with me and I'm just like, all right, you write? He's like, we're not gonna judge you, like it's not a, you gotta be good thing, we just having fun. So I recorded two songs. Are you, were you, take a step back, were you shy? Were you Super not? Super shy. So you were not comfortable I mean, it's it's a big step to yeah, get in yes. front and do something like that. Right. It was. It was. I remember the very first time I tried to rap in front of an audience. It was at a pep rally in high school, and I had spent two weeks rehearsing this 16-bar verse that I had wrote. And it comes time to me for me to spit it, and my mind goes blank. Yeah. And I'm just like, yo, I had the worst stage fright. But being with them, they made me feel so comfortable because. You know, I didn't feel like I was alone at that moment. Like, I could look at them and they gonna back me up. Like, if you mess up, we got you, so it's cool. So they just made it easy. So at that point, it was just like, now I'm just getting into having fun. And even before that, like, they would have little rap battles and I would try to freestyle, and I'm terrible at freestyling. But they never, like, judged me, never picked on me. It was just like, ah, you did good today. But this is amongst your friends. Just my that's friends. That's what that was. And that's what it was. That was my comfort zone. That was my circle. Earlier on, I think from the very first time I started rhyming until maybe, like, 2013, wow. I was never fully comfortable with my voice. But I hadn't found my range yet. So in the early days, my voice was super high. And when you hear your voice, you're like, is that what I really sound yeah. like? Like even now, I can't go back and listen, watch interviews. Because I'm just like, why is my voice, am I that country? Yeah. Why is my voice so high? So, but on record, I've, I've found a register where I enjoy it now. And it's not so high. And I've found how to play with my tone and when to make it low and when to make it high. So I've become way more comfortable in the way I sound. The next step was making good songs, I think, and learning flow and cadence. Because um, at this time, I'm just I'm just making music to make music. And then I meet Ninth. I meet Ninth around the fall of 2005. How'd you meet him? Uh, a guy in our organization that we created on campus by the name of Tom Fullery was uh, kind of his understudy. He was learning how to make beats, you know, about Fruity Loops. So we asked him, like, yo, can you come talk to my friends? Like, we just making music, we love you to listen to our mixtape, and he came by. And he sat with me and about 20 of my friends and listened to our mixtape from top to bottom. And he came to me and he said, you're the star, but you have to work on cadence and your inflections and your breath control. Like, you're a star, but we gotta build you. What did he, what do you think he saw in you? What do I think he saw? I think he saw me filling a void. I think at that time I was a, a female and at this time there weren't a lot of females in the forefront. And he heard how lyrical I was. It was like, yo, I see the superpower in you, but you don't know how to control it yet. You know, we talked about it now, we talk about it like Jean Grey, mm. if, you, if you know about mm -hmm. super comics, how much power she had, but it took her a while to learn how to control it. Yeah. When to turn it on, when to turn it off you know, how much of it to exude. So that's what he saw. You know, he saw like, yo, you have superpowers, but now I have to show you how to control it, how to work with those. I used to get nervous. I wouldn't have the next one. Yeah. Did that's, you have that? That is me. That's me with every single project. You know, I'm just like, man, how am I one gonna grow from the last one? Yeah. It's with every project I wanna grow and it's just like, is this the last one? Like, am I a one and done? Yeah. You know, is the next one gonna be good or am I just gonna flop and nothing else is gonna come from this? Like, that's something I always worry about. Is it frustrating? It can be if you let it be. Um, it's, it's a mental thing that you have, to, it's like a battle with yourself that you have to have. Like, I have to tell myself, don't overthink it. Don't put pressure on yourself. It's gonna come but you can't put pressure on yourself because you'll think your way out of it. 
I think now it's just a lot of overthinking instead of just living in the moment and knowing like you've done this, I don't know how many, I put out eight projects. Like, so why would it leave you? Why would it leave, yeah. It is you. Like, Do you think that's a driver, meaning it's a motivator for you? Yeah, definitely. It pushes me, you know, battle with myself, you know. I'm, like even my old basketball coaches, they used to tell me like, um, I used to tell you you can do something because I know if I told you that, you would work 10 times harder to prove me wrong. Mm. And that's how it is. It's just like, I have to, it's like a battle myself. Like, you're not going to fail. You're going to succeed at this one. Like, we're going to battle this out and I'm going to win at the end of the day. So it's, it's this crazy back and forth. So we'll talk about the Grammys, which is clearly important. But mm -hmm. what's the motivator for you today? What, what gets you, do you have a chip on your shoulder? What's the? It's a few things. I, I definitely have a chip. One, I think, because for so long, people told me I couldn't do it. Mm. Couldn't do it. One, because of just how hard it is as a woman trying to do it. Um, but like the, the fun things that you do it and wake up for is the kids. Like my niece and nephew, like mm. when I'm riding with them and they're reciting the lyrics or, you know, I can look at little girls and they're like, yo, like a lot of parents, like dads and mom, they'll send me or tweet me videos like, yo, my kid is rapping your lyrics mm. or I have something that I can listen to with my child and we both like it. We can talk about it. Um, so just showing them like what a female in hip hop looks like, like that's one. But I definitely have a chip. Too. You, like, I I, like I'm, I'm curious because I'm thinking about my own daughter right now. Um, mm -hmm. I think she gets she gets a kick out of the fact when people know our brands, like right. you know. So I'm trying to imagine, is it because, like, they know who you are, and that it's a feel good. It yeah, must definitely, definitely a feel good when you're acknowledged and recognized for what you do from people that don't even know you. Like it's like, wow. Like I was at a show one time, and it'll be moments like, a girl came to a show I had in Austin, and she said. My friend died this morning, mm. my best friend. And you're the only reason I got through today because I was trying to get to this show. And it 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 feels good but at the same time you realize the power that you had. Mm. And that could be a scary thing for some people. You know, some people might power trip off it, but for me it's just like I acknowledge it, like what I have has a purpose. It inspires somebody, it gets somebody through the day. And I have to think about how the music made me feel when I was growing up. And to know that you're a part of that for somebody else, like, I don't even know how to describe that. But I think that's the thing that I hold on to the most. Do you think, do you know who your fans are? Meaning, are they, is it male, is it female, is it predominantly one or the other from that, do you know? Yeah, from the analytics, yeah. you know, based on analytics, I know. Um, I know that it's mostly men. Uh, the last time I checked, it's 73% men, uh, 73, 27% women. Um, do you find that strange? I do. I, at first I did. You know, I, you would think because I'm a woman doing it, you know, and I'm, I speak for women. I want to represent women. I thought they would be the first ones to gravitate, um, especially black women. But it's more men, you know. And to me, it opened my eyes to this false narrative of a, a lot of people like to blame men for misogyny and hip hop, you know, and, and, and just supporting, you know, that whole not notation that women have to be sexy or women can't rhyme. But for me, it's a whole different story. Like I go to shows and it's mostly men and I'm fully clothed like from neck to my toes. So it's just like men do care about women in hip hop. And even the men that have kind of put me on, whether it's the Ninth Wonder or Kendrick Lamar or Dr. Dre or Jay-Z, they're all men. Do you, do you think, uh, and again, I'm coming in from a completely different perspective, yeah. but what you're saying doesn't get spoken about. No, no. Um, and when I think about what you're saying, it's such a visual world today Mm -hmm. And it is about what they're not wearing, not right. what they're wearing, right. what, what they're, they're not, not wearing. wearing and the way they look and they appear. Mm -hmm. But what you're describing is the complete opposite. They're listening to you. you. Right. Why do you think people aren't talking about that? I don't, I don't know. That's, and that's the crazy. I think one is partly because a lot of us are somewhat 
programmed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, it's it's kind of like if we, they're stuck in the matrix and, and nobody doesn't know what the world is. So if somebody's pushing you this one image, if you only go to TV and radio to find hip hop or to find women in hip hop, then your whole idea is going to be skewed because they're only going to push you this one narrative. And if you sell something enough to somebody, they'll believe it. Did you want to give up? There were times where it crossed my mind, you know, where it's like, nobody's ever going to respect me. I'm too lyrical. I'm not sexy enough. I might not be pretty enough to what, you know, they think is pretty. Um, so, you know, it crossed your mind. It's like, maybe I should just throw in the hat. But I, I had to tell myself, like, you, you do this even if you weren't getting paid. So continue, just continue the course and you have a purpose. Again, like my nieces and nephews reminded me all the time. And two, like I thought about everything that the people in my circle invested in me. Don't let them down. So those are the things that reel me back in. Like it's give you, a, it would give me anxiety, letting <laughs> other people down. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I never wanted to be a failure. Like I thought about how, like Ninth Wonder, how much he invested, you know, how much money he spent every month into this studio to get these kids a place to come record. When we were hungry, how much money he spent to feed us. When we needed loans, how much money he loaned us for gas or for rent or for phone bills. And it's just like, he invested all that time. So who are you to just up and be like, ah, I told myself all I need is a roof over my head, a little food, some gas to get to the studio. And I wasn't, I didn't have a cell phone bill, I was on the family plan, so I wasn't worried about that. But as long as I had food, somewhere to sleep and gas to get to the studio, I was good. And I didn't go anywhere else, home in the studio, or I'd go to my sister's house to babysit and she'd give me money for that which I didn't need it, but that was all I did. So I lived bare minimum just to just to build what I wanted to build. Do you remember when a moment, at least for you, if you have to, you have to reflect back where this is, it's happening. I feel it, something's happening. Was there a song? Was there a, was there anything that just made you feel like I'm, something's going on here? Yeah, I think it was uh, my first album, The Idea Beautiful. And it was like several moments in it. The first one was being in my first magazine. You know, Knife was like, once you get on your first magazine or you make it on TV, that's when it becomes real to other people. Yeah. And you can kind of feel the difference. Um, the second time was going to South Africa. Because at, at this time, I went to South Africa for, for the first time in 2012 for the idea of Beautiful. Was it the first overseas anything? Um, second, okay. second overseas trip. The first time was Europe, um, and it was a good tour. It wasn't my, it was Knife's tour. I was just supporting. Sure. So um, the first time I went to South Africa, I was headlining the show. And in the U.S., I'm doing tours, might be 200 people at a show, maybe 100, maybe 300. When I go to South Africa, it's 3,000 people. Did you know there were going to be 3,000 no, people? not for me. <laughs> when did you find out? Um, when we got there and, and they told me that where the venue was and I asked, well, what's the capacity? And it was like, you know, it could hold up to four. And I'm thinking in my head now, in my head I'm thinking, man, I'm about to do this show. It's going to be like 400 people and the whole venue going to be empty. Yeah. And that's just like, wow. And then I walk in and it's packed. And, you know, before me, though, opening up is a huge artist from South Africa. So I'm like, maybe they're mostly here for him. But I come on and everybody's still there. And I start performing and I can see I have them, they're locked. They're singing the words, some people are crying. And that's when it clicked for me. They knew who you were? They knew who I were. What was. does that feel like? I don't even know I put that in words. To fly 16 hours yeah. over water to a whole nother continent and get that kind of love. Where English is not your first language. I don't, I don't know how to put What year was this? 2012. Yeah. But it's, it's fulfilled. It, 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 was, it was like a switch turned on. It's just like, yo, you got it. It may not be in the U.S. right yeah. now. Yeah. But there are people around this world, you're changing their lives. Yeah. I was in Soweto and um, a mom came up to me and she said, uh, my little girl has something to tell you. A little girl, like three or four. And she looks up, she says, I want to be like you. Mm. 
that was that was it. Like it was like I definitely can't let you down because I used to be you to Lauren and Queen and Latifah. Like I looked at I want to be like them. So to have that, it's like oh man. So if if you take it from the first album to this album now, mm -hmm. what happened between? To be honest, uh, several things. The first the first big thing was Kendrick Lamar being asked to be on To Pimp a Butterfly. Like How does that, that happen? <laughs> we, we built a relationship, like we've known each other, respect each other's work since about 2010, 2011. So, you know, we had worked together on one song before, he and Ninth had worked together. But um, I, don't, I'm, I don't know, like I, I wasn't in the studio when they came up with the idea. I hear the story though, you know, they're working on a song and he's like, and I need somebody. Terrence is telling me a story and somebody calls out a name and somebody else calls in a name and he goes, Rhapsody. And just like that, like for whatever he was going for with complexion, I fit the idea that he had. And you know, that's just from us building a relationship and him following me in my career for so long. The Grammy, did you think that this album would be, would get a Grammy no. nomination? No. And that's not because I didn't think it was good enough. I definitely think it should have. But I always looked at the Grammys as a popularity contest. Yes. Yeah. You know? Like, you know, you can have an artist that comes out and puts an album out, you know automatically, oh, they're gonna, definitely yeah. going to be nominated just for their name and their brand. And it's not has nothing to do with the music, per se. It's just who they are. And I'm not a, a, a popular, my celebrity isn't to that level where I thought I would be recognized for the Grammys, that people would vote for me, you know, because enough people would don't know me. That's yeah. what I'm thinking. So, you know, I was like, I, I know the music is good enough and should be, but I was like, no, nah, not When you heard, what did you, what, what happened? <laughs> I was, I woke up to it. It's 5.30 in the morning in LA. Um, and at first, like, it took a while to really sink in. Someone call you? You heard it? How did you Nine hear? text me. And I sleep light, so I heard it, and I woke up, and I, I sat up immediately. And it's just like, I didn't know how to feel. Yeah. I didn't, like, I, I think I asked myself, like, how are, you, how are you supposed to act now? Yeah. Like, what are you supposed to do? Are you supposed to take it in? And that lasted for about two hours. And um, a friend of mine by the name of Law at Rock Nation called me, and he was congratulating me and talking to me. And then he started talking about the journey that I took to get here. And all of that came and tears just started yeah. rolling. It's like, you have come so far. Do you know what this means? Like, things are definitely gonna change now. It's the, it's the highest acknowledgement in music that you can get. Any, so that's any it, female artists call and congratulate? Uh, not call, no. Uh, I wanna say Rodiga might have text or tweeted. I didn't get a call from any though. Not that I can remember. But it means something to you. It, yeah. it should mean. It, it, oh, yeah. From what I read, it means a lot in this oh. respect of. Yes. Yeah, like the first one I think that I've sat and really had a conversation about it with was Missy Elliott. Yeah. And that was two weeks ago. Um, and I, for me to be a woman and for other women, it's because I know that they can relate. Like they know the struggle. Like Knife knows how hard it is because he's been with me. Yeah. But he's not a woman, so he really doesn't know all the way how it feels. Yeah. And when you can see these other women that you know have walked the same path, that have dealt with these same struggles, and they reach back and they acknowledge you and, and tell you like we're proud of you. Like, you know, that's like seeking, you know, um, from your parent. Yeah. You know, like uh just saying like we're proud of you. It's validation. That validation. Yeah. That week, that whole week was amazing. Um, you know, just going out and for people to just stop me and talk to me and tell me like, we're so proud of you. It's amazing what you are doing. Like it is even just talking like to Kendrick's camp, you know, I got a, a homie, uh, Rhett One. And I, at the Grammys when I got there, he. he brought me in and hugged me and he just whispered in my ear like yo you are what you're doing is crazy it's incredible it's unheard of and what you represent he's saying it because why i think because he they know my journey yeah. they know how hard it is to break through and again to not have the celebrity to not have a, a 
uh, charting song on yeah. the radio. When the album came out, it hit Billboard at like 152. You know, to do all that and to still get acknowledged at the Grammys. Yeah. Amongst, and this is a year of amazing music. Yeah. Jay-Z, Kendrick's came out that year. Childish Gambino put out an amazing album. Migos, like, and all of that for me to get acknowledged. That's, that's, that's a journey, man. You know, you mentioned ninth a lot. Yeah. Not in a, it's a great thing. Right. But when I think of all the people I've ever met, not many people have somebody like that. Right. Right. But you, you, you fully appreciate what he's been and what he's done for you. Completely. He's protected me. He's taught me so much. And that's the thing, like, that I'm thankful for. A lot of artists don't have that. Yeah. You know, they get in this business um, and they don't have somebody to guide them to tell them what to look for, the do's and the don'ts, because he's already walked this path. They don't have people that want to genuinely protect them, their health-wise, mentally, and their art, you know? And so I recognize that because I've seen it. I've seen artists that don't have that, and I see what happens to them. And they're never happy people. And they fall out of love with what they're doing. And I don't want to. I don't want to be that. Well, I have to say, Rhapsody, I've enjoyed this. I'm I a to. huge fan. Uh, I adore your music. My wife adores your music. I could listen to it all day long. Uh, I think you have a sound that's truly different and a voice that's different. Uh, it's very honest, and I love that. So Thank to that, so I much. say cheers, cheers and to, you to being and truly self-made. Truly. Thank you so much. I adore you and this oh. and this drink. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>